A blessed Sabbath to everyone. I just heard a deep voice back there. Amen. I knew there was Eddie back there. Uh, what a joy to see all of you here today. And I'm glad that I can still recognize you even though you're wearing a mask. But it's okay. And um, what a privilege we have to come together and worship the Lord uh, today. When Alina was singing for us that beautiful song that we will gather at the river, using my imagination, and I pray sanctified by the Holy Spirit, I thought of the river of life in heaven when we would meet there, never to be separated. But I also thought that if you go to Washington State, right there by the Columbia River, Alina's going to be somewhere around there, right, Ethel? You know that area better than most of us. But uh, that thought came to my mind as I was hearing that song this morning. And um, today also, we are so happy that by God's amazing grace, we could sing even behind the mask, okay? Um, it's not easy, but at least we can praise our Creator together. I'd like to invite you to please bow your heads with me, whether you are at home in Zoom or here at church. Let us pray. Father, this morning as we come to acknowledge you as our Creator, as our Redeemer, as our Savior, we praise your name. We bow down before you in adoration and recognition. Because, Lord, we are learning to expect miracles made by you in our midst, in our lives. And that is specifically regarding, related to see you bringing to your kingdom expanding and growing the population of heaven through the witness of your children. And like our scripture reading today, who is sufficient for this? We realize that none of us, but yet, thanks to the ministry, the work of the third person of the Holy, of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, all of us, could be used by you. And with that in our minds, expecting you to do miracles of salvation, of encouragement and empowerment for us to do your work, we pray these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, if you look into our scriptures, Specifically in verse 15, it makes mention of the fact that you, I, can be and should be a fragrance, a aroma, a smell that can cause an effect in the life of the believers, but also on the unbeliever. God is counting on you. It doesn't matter the physical distance, okay? The six feet. Still, you can smell. Or the fragrance of Christ in you will spread out. People will know that a son, a daughter of God is around. He or she is close and you can sense that. The context of our message today is all about grace. God's amazing grace. The wonderful, unbelievable things God does in our lives. And with that in mind, I like to refresh your memory by bringing to your attention some of the Levitical laws. There were laws there to... Make sure to protect those that, for instance, accidentally kill somebody and they could run to a refuge city. Amen? Okay? So we know of that one. It was made clear there also that there were certain things or circumstances 
that would make a person unclean. For instance, no one should touch a dead animal. So if you saw a dead animal, do not touch it. Why? You would be unclean. You would not even supposed to touch a dead body of a human being because by touching it, you were unclean for the rest of that day. You could not go to the temple for that day until that day was over because you were unclean. If that wasn't enough, the Pharisees in the days of Jesus had established the regulations that if you um, contact a Gentile or you would sit down and eat with a Gentile, you were unclean. And you would wonder today, how would the gospel be preached that way? It was like an oxymoron. It was like a contradiction. But that's how far they went in those days. You were supposed to wash seven times your hands before you were supposed to eat. Not only that, the cups also, wash them once, twice, thrice, until seven. The cups, the plates were supposed to be there. Never enter, like I said, the house of a Gentile. Never eat with them because if you did, um, you would become unclean. You were not supposed to walk more than a thousand steps on a Sabbath. That was it. So you were going to go to witness or visit someone at the 1,000 steps. You were supposed to keep track of them. You were supposed to stop. You should not go any further than that. The list goes on and on. So when Jesus did indeed touch some people that were considered unclean, instead of becoming unclean, he reversed the effect of the belief. He made that person whole. He changed. He transformed. And this is exactly where grace comes in through you and through me. God wants to use you and me today precisely to be the agents, not only of witnessing, but seeing people's life being transformed and changed. For instance, remember those 10 lepers? They were healed. One of them came back to say thank you to Jesus. Jesus touched him. But according to the law, he was unclean. What a wonderful thing to know that Jesus looked at it from a different perspective. Jesus now was in his way in his daily ministry. And while he was journeying and this multitude was around him, People were pushing. They wanted to be close to Jesus. And all of a sudden, Jesus stops. And he says, who touched me? And the disciples would immediately say, what is wrong with you? Don't you see the multitude coming around you? And they're all pushing, wanting to touch you? And he realized, power has come out of me. We know who touched him, remember? Remember? This was a lady that for 12 years, according to the law, she was unclean because of this bleeding, this hemorrhage. So Jesus, by the touch of this woman, was unclean. But did you see what happened to the woman? It stopped. She thought nobody had noticed her. She was just getting away from the group, praising God, thanking God. She knew something had happened to her. And Jesus says, who touched me? Oh, I was catch. He noticed. He noticed how Jesus treated her. He was admired. He, he was in awe that this woman would have such faith that she said, if I can only touch what? Just a little border there of his garment. That would be more than enough. And it did happen. Friends, Jesus is amazing in what he did there. Well, he wasn't clean now. And he's going to a house where there is a dead body. So not only was unclean because she touched him according to the regulations and 
the 613 laws that the Pharisees added to the regulations for everybody, now he's going to a house where this prince and there was a dead little girl. And Jesus, when he comes there, he did not keep a six feet distance. Actually, he went, grabbed her by the hand. Oh, I mean, he's like double unclean now. Okay? He's double unclean when he touches her, but he gives her life. He brings her back to life. He returns this girl to her parents. And they were there together rejoicing in the Lord. Friends, when he took by the hand this girl, there, there it was. What Jesus was in fact doing was starting a revolution of the amazing grace of God. So when rumor went out that Jesus could be, could he be the long awaited Messiah? Is this the one we have been waiting for? Oh, but wait, he's unclean. Something doesn't add here. Something is not working right. But there he is. Jesus is starting a revolution of grace. A grace that goes beyond the beliefs and the practices of his day. By now, he had crossed the border of the territory of Israel and on the other side of the Jordan, on the east side of the Jordan River, were the ten cities, Decapolis. And Jesus has come to unclean territory because heathens lived out there. Gentiles had lived out there. And Jesus, as he had crossed the Lake of Galilee with his disciples, he is there. And when he gets there, ho, oh, friends... This was completely unusual. From the cemetery where the dead are comes someone running like with flames coming out of his eyes and his mouth making these horrible sounds and he's running toward Jesus and the disciples decided this is not safe. Let's go back to the boat. But Jesus stood exactly where he was. He did not move an inch back. Actually, he kept his eyes focused on this person that was running with him. You see, uh, this was just amazing. Not long before that, Jesus had praised a Roman centurion, a Gentile. And he had said, I have never seen so much faith. In Israel, now he really cut off all the leadership of Israel, saying, not even you leaders who make all these laws, I have never seen such faith like I've seen in this man who did not need it for me to go all the way to his house. All I had to do was believe. And he believed, and when he was on his way back home, his servants came and he inquired, at what time did he heal? And he noticed it was at the exact time when Jesus says, go back home, your servant is healed. Friends, let's go back on the other side of the Lake of Galilee because the person running to Jesus is the story described in Luke chapter, I mean, I'm sorry, in Mark chapter five. Gospel of Mark chapter 5 and right there from the first verses it starts describing that from this place the cemetery someone coming from the cemetery is clean and the one who's coming happens to be demon possessed now triple quadruple and all numbers unclean Jesus is standing and this person is running toward him and Jesus, as he looked at him, he knew what was the desire, the unspoken want of this demon possessed. And so he did what he did in other occasions as well. Leave him. Go away from him to these demons. 
So he's telling him that to the demons. They go away and the demons, of course, as soon as they saw Jesus, recognize him. And when they recognize him, they could do no other than to bow down. Amen. They bow down before Jesus and say, Jesus, why have you come to torment us? Jesus was not there to torment them. Jesus was to set free this man who was unclean. And after Jesus had set free this man, the demons said, hey, we need your permission for something. They needed to ask Jesus permission for something, permission. And what was that? We know. Can we go to those pigs over there that are pasting over there? Yes, go ahead. So they went, over 2,000 of them, they all went through a cliff and died. So those who were caring for them went back to the city to tell them what had happened. But not only that, they lost their pigs. So it was not just a miracle they went to say, you lost your pigs. The people came out. They, what is this? This man, according to the Gospel of Mark, he tormented the whole region. He would go around naked. Can you imagine? There was no chain that could hold his hands. So, according to the people, this was an unteachable, unsafe, not worthy of God's grace, unclean man. But Jesus saw something different. Someone who could be taught. Someone who could go out. Someone who could be loved. Someone who could be transformed. He looked them through his eyes. God's eyes. And this is exactly what God is wanting to teach us today. Friends. As we speak of him. And one more other example. Today. There are important implications for us. Not only is he a unclean person, when Jesus, when the multitude came to where Jesus was, they saw the man that during the night and the, during the day will go out scaring the socks away of everybody, but he was seated there by Jesus in the faculty of his mind, change, transformed by the power of Jesus. And they said, um, Jesus, you're bad news for us. You're bad business for us. We prefer you go from here. And you ask, why would people, why in the world would someone ever tell Jesus to go away after the miracle that he had done? Well, the answer is very simple. The people who would do that in the past or in the present is because they could not stand the presence of someone worse than them. It had to be as good as them, but not as worse. This demon was unclean. Not only was he unclean, but he had those Pigs or the demons go to the pigs and die. And that was all bad. They will prefer that than to have Jesus in their lives. And today, friends, we are called never, ever to look at people in a different way. And if this was not enough, this individual, other gospel says there were two. And instead of one demon... They said they were a legion. And the legion was composed of 6,000 Roman soldiers. And if there was two demons, there were 12,000 demons there that day. And poor pigs. What happened to them? Friends, this person asked Jesus, Hey, you set me free. Can I go with you? Can I go with you? And Jesus said, no. What, what is this? I mean, he set him free. Why would Jesus not let him come with him? He went to the rich young ruler. He invited him to follow him. And he said, no. Here's someone who said yes. And he doesn't allow him to follow him. What does he do? 
You know the story. He told him, go to your people and tell them the wonders that God has done in you. Friends, this is from where we conclude and have the title of our meditation today. The most unlikely person Jesus calls to send out. This is Jesus' way of telling you and telling me that there is no way that anyone who is not demon-possessed, who apparently is clean, who is a church member, but has not experienced the power of God in your life, Jesus says, oh, you are my favorite. You are the number one. I am sending you. I am still remembering the day or the Sabbath, the last Sabbath we were here, service was over, and Ethel and Xiomara came to the church office because Ethel wanted to figure out a way how to reach her neighbor. Friends, I pray this will become so contagious that every one of us, with or without a mask, preferably with a mask now, but if you're outside a building, you don't have to wear it. But just find a way like the Lord is impressing not only Ethel, but I'm sure he's impressing you too with your neighbors, your friends, your co-workers to tell them the story how Jesus can send the least likely person to be an ambassador, a messenger, a witness for him. This is the God that we serve. This is the amazing Savior who is looking at all of us face to face, eye to eye, and he's saying, I'm trusting you. I am empowering you with the Holy Spirit. Your work is stand. I will do the battle. I will fight. I will bring down the barriers and you will see with your own eyes my might, my transforming power in the life of those you are praying for, you are being kind with, whom you are sharing with, your food, your flowers, your bread, a card, whichever way the Lord impresses you to use. So here is God making a point of using the least likely person to be anointed. Did you know that this man is the first person described in the Bible to go out to preach the good news? You don't see this is before Paul. This is before the 12 apostles. This is before the 70 that were sent. This is what I am amazed about God. He uses, he does things that are marvelous, that just show how his grace works in the life among his people. How gracious is God with you and with me that he will not take anything into consideration that said, well, you can't go. No. God sees the potential in all of us. God sees the power he can reveal in all of us. And he continually calls us, challenges us, put our trust in him. Here is the first anointed man with the Holy Spirit going out to be a witness for Jesus Christ. It was not a disciple. It was not any of those great names in the Bible. It was a demon-possessed person to go out to the region of Gadara, Decapolis, and, and preach the good news of what God can do in the life, even of the worst case you can think of, of someone who would be a potential candidate for heaven. Friends, who of us today would say that after a demon possessed came into the church, he is healed. Jesus has set him free. And we decide him to make him personal ministry director. We would say, no, he has to keep the Sabbath first. He needs to become vegetarian or vegan. And we'll start thinking of all the things down the list they're supposed to do before they can go out. But this man just right out of, I mean, it was just minutes after he was set free, Jesus says, go to your loved ones. Go to your family. Tell them what God has done. Is that pure grace or what? That Jesus would come and set him free. And not only set him free, he sent him. 
What was his sermon? What, what was he going to say? Did Jesus tell him, go tell him about the 28 fundamental beliefs? Did Jesus tell him, go and begin with Daniel chapter 7, or you can start at chapter 2, then 7, 9, and all Daniel and all Revelation? No. His message was what God has done for you. How great mercy has revealed to you. Friends, it cannot be any more simple than that. And I want to close this morning with another example of what God does. I mean, if grace shocks us, God's grace just blows our mind at the people, the places, the circumstances that he goes. Later down in his ministry, there were two ways to get to go from Judea to Galilee. Okay? Judea is in the south. Okay? And Galilee, it's up north, about 70 miles. So, the Jews, the chosen people of God, would never go the shortest route. Why? Because you had to go through Samaria. But here's Jesus. Well, before we go to Jesus, there was the other route, the long way, where you would not even touch or come close to a Samaritan. Those have breed people who were some way Jew, but yet mixed with those Assyrians that came and took them, took them to another land and forced them into other marriages. And they were all mixed. So there they were. But the gospel of Jesus, of his life, in the gospel of John, chapter 4, tells us the story that Jesus had to go to Sychar. Friends, it says he had to. I mean, why would he go this route shorter if he was going to be involved with people that would make him unclean? Well, we've seen already that Jesus was not concerned about the regulation, not because he didn't believe in those. He inspired those. It was through the Holy Spirit for the protection and the safety and the good health. But the people took it to levels where separated them from others. They misunderstood the whole purpose of God's health laws. But Jesus goes to Sychar because he had to. And when he gets there, he sends the disciples, go and buy some food at town there in Sychar. I'm going to stay here by the well of Jacob. And while he's there, this lady shows up. And when she shows up, Jesus addresses her. That was unacceptable, unbelievable, and quite often or, or, or quite uh, honest, this was making him unclean again. Talking to this lady in public who is not his wife. He was single and she was not with her husband. And according to the regulation, no man should talk in public with a woman that was not his wife. That's part of all the regulations they had made in those days. Thank God for the gospel that brings down all these regulations that twist the character, the image we have of the most loving, compassionate God. So here's Jesus coming over, visiting there. He addresses her and he asks her, could you please give me water? We know the story. She said, how in the world you being a Jew ask me, a Samaritan woman, for water? Oh, Jesus was just hoping that she would say that, right? Well, you know something? I got a water that when I give it to you and you drink of it, you will never have to come. How, how is that? You have no rope. You don't have a bucket to get the water out of there. And you have this water? Which water is this? Ha, ah, Jesus again was waiting for that answer. Look, the water that I will give you when you drink it will turn you into a fountain. 
you will spring like a water and you will thirst no more. Oh, Lord Jesus, give me that water. He was waiting. She responded to that invitation that Jesus brought to her. Well, um, since you want some of that water, please go call your husband. Well, um, <clears throat> uh, I don't have a husband. Yes, you're saying right. You have had five. And even the one you're living with right now, he's not your husband. She could not fathom that Jesus knew so much about her without knowing her. You must be a prophet. You must be, we've been waiting for a prophet too here in Samaria. And I know you guys are waiting another one there in Judea. But wow, who are you? How did you know so much about me? She could not believe that Jesus had now unfold, open up her whole life. And what a different man is this. This man has treated me with respect, with grace. He's being kind to me. The woman that in town she was known as the husband stealer, the one who robbed the husbands to other ladies, Jesus is not treating me like the people in town treat me. He is gentle. He is kind. He is cordial. He's looking into my eyes. That was too much for her. The bucket, the recipient that she brought to carry the water to take home, she left it right there. And there she goes, the most unlikely, the least thought of person to go. And when she goes to town and she tells the people in town, hello, this is the message. This is you need to know the person who knows all of my life. They knew about her life. But it's her telling them, he knows all about me. You need to see him. Could this be the Messiah that we're waiting for? So the people decided to go. They believe her. In the past, they will not believe, have a word from her. But now there was something on her look and her eyes and the tone of her voice. We need to go and see what is she, who is she talking about? Two days, Jesus stayed right there. And it says in the Gospel of John, the whole city believe in him. Remember Jonah? The whole city of Sychar. Who was the one who took the good news to her? The least likely person. The one who Jesus now has offered the water of life. Her reputation has not changed. She might still be living. We don't know. The Bible doesn't mention. But she could still be living with a man who was not her husband. But here she is preaching Come see a man who has told me all of my life. That was her message. The people believed her. And this brings us to the closing of reflection today. What are the implications of the story of these two unclean, the least likely persons that God used? And they all went. Remember, Gospel of John chapter 4. Mark chapter 5, the 12 have not been sent yet, the 70 have not been sent out yet, but Jesus sending out to preach the good news of heaven through the least unlikely people, which means you and I are by God's measure the most likely people to be used by him. Can somebody say amen? God is counting on you. You cannot. We're asking God to change our lives, to change the life of the members of this church so this building will become a place where people, where God's people will come and pray, God, make miracles in my life. Begin with me first. Change me. 
have me see myself through your eyes, not through mine, because through my eyes, I can't. I'm too scared. I'm too nervous. I don't know. Well, Jesus is putting down all of my excuses and letting us all know that the least likely he will use, even if he has to use the rocks, he will use, but here you and I, in the full capacity of your abilities, trusted by God to tell others what a great God, what a great Savior, what a great friend you have found in Jesus. Isn't this pure grace that God will even consider me, consider you? We don't deserve this privilege to tell the story. Let's close our time together singing our closing hymn 457 that we will know that God in his infinite grace will use you and will use me to tell the most wonderful story in the whole universe. Let us pray. Dear Father, as we consider the story of Jesus, what has done to us, I pray that beginning with me, that you would send me to my neighbors, to my friends here where we live and wherever I may be at, that I would be used by you precisely to sh share with others that precious story. Lord, we've learned today that the least likely person can be used by you, even unclean, by the measure of the past, by the standards of the past. But today, Jesus has washed us in his blood. He has made us clean. He has made us anew. Because if anyone is in, cre in Jesus Christ, he or she is a new creation. Lord, send us. Empower us. And open our eyes to see where you're working at. So that we can join you and tell them, let's follow Jesus. Lord, as we continue the rest of this gift of yours, the Sabbath day, this Sabbath afternoon, may we pray, may we consider those that you are impressing on our minds to lift up before you to introduce them to Jesus. May your amazing grace fill our lives and be the motivation, the inspiration, the source of power to share the wonderful story of Jesus. In his saving name, we all say, Amen. Amen.